Greetings, I'm Rob Redden. I happen to be the minister for the Grover Beach Church of Christ on the beautiful central coast of California. And I bring messages each week on this uh, media and appreciate each one of you uh, discovering this site and uh, uh, giving me the time to share this lesson with you and uh, cause you to think and help you to get into the Word of God. Today, I'm going to talk about Paul's declaration to the churches in Galatia that pretty well settles the matter with his debaters. I'll give you a little background in a moment. In Galatians six seventeen, he says, From now on, let no one cause trouble for me. For I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus. The background of Galatians is important. It's about his conflict with Judaizers. You may ask, who are the Judaizers? That term is reserved for those Jewish Christians that although they accepted Jesus Christ as the Messiah, deny that the law of Moses is done away. And therefore, the Gentiles converted to Christ must undergo circumcision in order to benefit from the death of Christ. Of course, Paul says that denies the gospel. It actually denies the efficacy of the blood of Christ as well as grace because it is incomplete. Grace isn't adequate or enough because man must do all these man all these laws of the laws uh, of Moses and in order for one to be forgiven of their sins. Having completed a refutation of that particular position and defended grace and the all-sufficiency of the death of Christ, Paul says to the Galatians, stop troubling me now because I bear on my body the marks, the brand marks of Jesus. You know, Paul's statement here, let no one trouble me, is not only a plea, but a warning against those who oppose his preaching the gospel. These Judaizers sought to undermine Paul's apostleship and his missionary work and his message and sought to turn his converts away from his teaching. In verse 17, Paul appears to give a solemn warning that to attack him is actually a sacrilege. He alludes to the scars left by his sufferings for Christ as the brand marks of his master's ownership. You know, devotees back then were tattooed or branded as well as slaves. The devotees were those devoted to their gods. And to attack them were to attack the God who owned them. Herodotus wrote, If any man receives a holy stigmata, which is the brand mark of the God he serves, Giving himself to God it is not lawful to touch him. That's from Peake's commentary, J.N. Sanders. Another scholar, Dysman, who was a Greek scholar, a Latin scholar, an archaeologist, refers to a bilingual papyrus, Egyptian and Greek, containing a spell in which the words occur I carry the corpse of Osiris. Should anyone trouble me, I shall use it against him.
It's like carrying a particular amulet that believed to be a protection against similar attacks by bearing the marks of Jesus. It's a warning against those who sought to harm him for preaching the truth of the gospel. You know, Paul is not a fatalist. He's not being superstitious here. He is confident that he will fulfill his ministry as he told the elders at Miletus, the elders of Ephesus. And we'll refer to those in a moment. There is nothing superstitious about this because he knows that the Lord will fulfill, will have him fulfill his ministry and that he will complete it and is a bad omen against those who would try to prevent that from happening. You know, there were numerous occasions when he was attacked that could have left him crippled or dead. When he was attacked and stoned, they dragged him outside the city and presumed that he was dead. Acts 14, 19. And a reference to that is in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. Instead, he woke up and returned to the city. And then the next day went on to Derby, which is about 20 miles, probably by foot. In Philippi, in Acts 16, he was beaten with rods, verses 22 and 23. He mentions that he had been beaten times without number in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 23. He had been whipped five times with 39 stripes, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four. The law prevented 40, so they going over 40, so they stopped at 39 when they were beaten. Paul mentions what he went through to tell a story of the old rugged cross to foreign in foreign fields. Nothing would stop him. Nothing would hinder him. Put him in prison. He taught the guards. He refused to allow harm to him to harm the gospel. You know, I mentioned Paul's words to the elders of Ephesus at Miletus on the coast of present-day Turkey. Paul's bravery and dedication and selflessness rings out from this passage in Acts 20. 22 through 24. And now behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me. What will happen to me there? Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I might finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord, the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. I'll tell you that, that gives me pause. I think that what Paul is saying that they can add to my scars that I already obtain my badge of honor. <clears throat> but I will not stop until they put me in the grave. Just notice what he said to the Corinthians in his first letter in chapter 4, 9 through 16. For I think God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and men. 
We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and roughly treated and are homeless. We toil working with our hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For you have, you, if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have become your father through the gospel. I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. How can we not be touched by that? Are we touched by the brand marks of Jesus? Of all those brands that harmed his flesh? You know, Paul bore the physical marks of a slave, a slave to Christ. What are ours? You know, in the Old Testament, the mark of a permanent slave was a pierced earlobe with an awl, Exodus 21, 6. And if we are not slaves to Christ, what are we? 1 Corinthians 7, 22. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freeman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. We are either slaves to sin or righteousness. Which is it? No middle ground here. Paul says in Romans 6, 17 and 18, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Is that uncomfortable for you? It has been for me. But when you understand that when you yield service to your leader <clears throat> without compromise, without condition, it's like slavery. You commit. And it is clear what each slavery leads to. In Romans 6 and verse 16, do you not know? That when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. So hopefully we are pursuing the path that leads to eternal life. In Romans 6, 22, But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. You know, we may not be, <clears throat> at the present, scarred and beaten here in America for serving Christ. It certainly is possible this will happen in the lifetime, perhaps, of our children or grandchildren if this country continues on the path it is on. But we still must have our marks of ownership that we belong to the Lord. Paul could point to his scars and call them his brand marks. We still must have our brand marks of ownership as well. Albert Barnes, speaking about this, a renowned Bible commentator in the 1800s. But let us have some marks of our attainment to the Lord by a holy life, by self-denial, by subdued animal affections, by zeal in the cause of truth, by an imitation of the Lord Jesus, and by the marks of suffering in our body, if we should be called to it. Let us have some evidence that we are his and be able to say when we look on death and eternity, we bear with us the evidence that we belong to the Son of God. A holy life, he says, 
the people that should be seen as living by a higher moral standard. In Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. In Matthew 5, 47, the New Living Translation captures this quite well. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. Jesus is saying, you got to hold the bar higher than the world does. If you're going to be influential and in effect a change in the lives of lost souls, the sinners in the world. And the mark of self-denial in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, this tells me a couple things. We've got to choose where our loyalties lie. And we've got to accept the consequences of that choice. And following Christ is not a walk in a garden. It's not a stroll in the park. It is not rocking in a rocking chair because a cross is heavy to bear and it almost crushed Jesus. Take up your cross and follow me. In other words, when you choose to follow me, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, a man is willing to die. Let's face it. Jesus is not asking anything of us that he was not willing to do himself. Zeal in the cause of truth, said Barnes. You know, Jesus is not asking for fanaticism. Fanaticism leads to irrational behavior and exposure to unnecessary dangers to self and others. Zeal in the cause of truth shows passion for what one believes, but it also respects the rights of others not to believe. We can't hit somebody on the side of the head and say, if you don't accept Jesus, I'm going to hit you a little harder. We cannot force people to believe. And if they want to believe in Allah, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, or any of the number of false prophets, so be it. But we love them in truth and would do whatever we can to help them to see the error of their way and to teach them way, the way of the Lord more excellently as Priscilla and Aquila did with Apollos in Acts chapter 18. The mark of imitating Jesus. There are numerous scriptures that urge us to follow Jesus' example. Grab a pen and paper and write these down and read them. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Philippians 2, 5. 1 Peter 2, 21. 1 John 2, verse 6. Matthew 11, 29 and 30. John 13 and 15. Those are just the ones that have come to my mind. Of course, he's not talking about imitating Jesus' miracles. He's not talking about making the claims that he did. He's talking about his character. He's talking about the spirituality. He's talking about the love of God and humankind. Yes, these verses are so important. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be imitators of me, just as I am also of Christ. John 13, 15, for I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. And Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm gentle and humble in your heart and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my load is light. 
but it's still a yoke. A yoke is for you and me. And it just hit me. The yoked animal can only do what the master demands that it do. Plow. Our yoke means that we are under the control of Jesus Christ. Are we willing to submit to that? A man had a dream and said, Lord, you're, you've given me a cross too hard to bear. And the Lord says, look out into the field. There are various sizes of crosses out there. You go out there and find one that is suitable for you. And he finally, after long research and trying each one, he brought one back and he says, Lord, I've found the cross that I can bear. And Jesus said, that's the very cross I gave you. We must take that yoke upon us and be faithful regardless of the load, because it will not be too hard to bear. In 1 Peter 2.21, for he has called us for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Do we look upon our suffering as a privilege to suffer for Christ? The persecution that we might have and receive? For John 2, 6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Philippians 2, 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And be willing to lay down our life for him. Revelation 2.10, do not fear what is what you're about to suffer. Jesus said, behold, the devil is about to cast some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. And until death is not stressing faithfulness for the rest of your life, although we must hold out and that's true. But here, Jesus is talking about being persecuted and not giving up and being faithful even if it means the loss of our life until death means to the point of death. You and I may not have the physical scars of Paul or the other apostles or Stephen or James or the thousands who suffered for Christ in the past. But we must have the marks of identification. If you're stopped by the police, he asks you for your driver's license, insurance card, and registration. He wants to make sure that you are a legitimate driver. He needs to pr pr prove to himself that you have a right to drive and a right to drive that vehicle and that you're not wanted because a warrant has been issued for your arrest, and that you're not a fleeing fugitive. Our identifying marks are not on a card, but are written on our hearts. But the world should be able to see it. Often a soldier shows his scars with pride, and exultation as proof of his attachment to his country. Numerous scars, the loss of an arm, an eye, a leg, are thus much valued and vaunted pledges of attachment to liberty and a passport to the confidence of every man who loves his country. I don't know who said that, but it's powerful. As we see all these soldiers that have come home from battle without arms, legs, and eyes, we can understand Paul's appeal to all his scars as the testimony of his faithful service to the Lord's army. So I want to urge you to consider your relationship 
with Jesus. The Jewish males received a mark of their identity with the covenant of Abraham, circumcision. In fact, that word became an identifying expression for the Jews, the circumcision. True circumcision is the Christian, is for the Christian. Spiritually, when he's baptized, he receives the promise from God. Colossians 2, 11 through 12. And him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. We may not possess physical marks of ownership by Jesus, but we have the marks that others can see. Number one, we're baptized believers. Number two, we bear the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. So why don't you and I roll up our sleeves and put on the marks of the Lord, showing that he possesses us, that he is the rightful owner of our body, soul, and spirit. We will not only change our own lives, but change the lives around us. The pagan who had the brand marks of his God on his body foolishly felt safe that those who bothered him would reap vengeance from his God. But the Christian, marked by the fruit of the Spirit, will have the respect from others and also will lead others to embrace Christ and we have the assurance that the Lord will not forsake us, that the Lord will be with us forever. You know, we are moved by those who sacrifice so much for our, of themselves for something they believed in. We must show the world our marks, our identifying marks of Christ. And I hope that you will be able, you are willing and able to begin your new life in Christ Jesus. Confess your faith in Christ, repenting of your sins, and be baptized to put on Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, may the world see that we've been touched by Jesus to the point that we bear in our hearts and in our actions, the brand marks of Jesus. We pray the world can see only those that reflect the one we belong to, that we're loyal to, that we serve, that we will truly serve him regardless of the consequences or the circumstances. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for listening to this message. Invite your friends to uh, tune in to this broadcast. And um, let me hear from you if you have a question. rredden604 at aol.com. That's spelled R-R-E-D-D-E-N 604 at aol.com. If you're in our neighborhood, come and visit us at 202 South 8th Street, in Grover Beach, California, one block south of the Main Street Grand Avenue. And if you're not in our areas, if you're not in our area, Google Church of Christ near me and visit a Church of Christ near you this Sunday, this Lord's Day. So until we meet again, God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Goodbye.